Welcome back to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and this afternoon I am joined by Lawrence Cornley, who is dialing in from the green room. Welcome to the Axon Bulletin on a Tuesday afternoon, Lawrence. We will also be joined by Liam Carrigan, dialing in from Japan. We will be welcoming uh, Liam in shortly. Um, it's the big week, Lawrence, and there is lots to talk about, and we're going to get stuck in to the um, announcement that was made this morning. And before we do that, I'm going to bring Liam in all the way from Japan. There he is, Liam Carrigan. And um, once we get stuck into this, Liam, we'll be hearing your thoughts as well. hope everybody is well. Um, it is the week of the big Glasgow derby. And obviously, there's been an announcement today around the hmm. officials. Now, we're going to get to that. I want to rewind. I want to take this in stages. I want to go back... To, because we're always called paranoid Celtic fans, aren't we? I mean, Tom Campbell wrote a book about it. Um, is it all in the mind? Well, I'm not so sure it is. So this season, uh, we've had a lot to contend with. We've had um, Crawford Allen stepping down. I'm not sure when he relinquishes his duties, but he's stepping down um, as the head of the referees. Uh, we have had situations where Brendan Rodgers has been banned for the first time in his coaching career for having the audacity to question the competence of an, uh, an official in Scottish football after the game in Tynecastle. And then we've basically been slapped on the wrists and laughed at by the SFA against Livingston with their decision to appoint Don Robertson as the referee. Don't get me started on uh, the VAR, um, Alan Muir, another joke. And then the Rangers game, Lawrence, we're going into this. And what does, the, what does the SFA think is a good idea? A good idea to bring in John Beaton, the man who enjoys a pint in the Rangers boozers with Rangers fans after a Glasgow derby where his decision-making could definitely be questioned. Uh, and the man, of course, on the VAR when Awata... Um, is penalised in the box, which uh, results in us conceding a penalty against Hearts. And it was the worst decision I think I've seen since VAR was introduced. And of, of course, Yang was also sent off in the same game. Uh, so we'll give him, we'll give him the prize. We'll give him the prize of refereeing the game at Ibrox, uh, Nick Walsh on the VAR. We're going to be talking about that. Liam's going to be coming back in. We're going to rewind first before we bring it up to date, Lawrence Conley. Yeah, you, you know, I don't think anyone among the Celtic Sorry, did I disappear for a second there, guys? You did, mate, you did. Well, I, I think maybe uh, the Gremlins are trying to pull out the Wi-Fi, so if I do disappear, just talk amongst yourself till I come back in. Um, we're going to go back, because it's the 30th anniversary, of course, of the takeover. The takeover of Fergus McCann. Um, anyone of our vintage will have lived through it, um, and we'll enjoy the current series that is being aired on the Celtic Exchange. Anyone who doesn't know that that part of their history, go and watch it. I implore you to go and watch the Celtic Exchange interviews with the likes of Tom Grant, David Lowe, Matt McLone, Brian Dempsey, Hugh Keevans. Fantastic insight into what went on back then. But the Messiah, the man who came to save us, Lawrence, was a wee guy in a bonnet called Fergus McCann who flew over and made sure that Celtic did not go into administration. We were so close, they had already nominated the administrators. That's something we found out from Brian Dempsey. They had already nominated the administrators. Why are we talking about Fergus McCann, Lawrence? Because Fergus McCann took on the SFA cabal, and oh, how we could be doing with a Fergus McCann figure right now, couldn't we? Yeah, it'd be great. You know, Fergus, uh, he, he wouldn't take their secret gut. The behind closed doors committee's assurance that nothing untoward had happened. And, they, and you know, why should he? When FIFA were, were saying, well, no, they told them, George Cadet should be free, free to play. Yeah. And obviously, having the gremlins affected. It went to arbitration, and uh, yeah, Pegasus was proved right. But I'm back. I don't know if you can hear me, guys. Yes, I can hear you, mate. Right, sorry, sorry if I am dropping out a wee bit. I'm not quite sure what's causing that. But on you go, Lawrence. We were talking about wee Fergus. Yeah, Fergus. Uh, you, you know, it was proved that Celtic were cheated out of being allowed to play George Cadetti. Uh, eight league games, you know, semi-final, which we lost. 
Jim Farry himself alleged he, he, act, he wasn't alone in his actions. There was a certain Sandy Bryson involved who, who seemed to avoid any fallout at that point, but should he have a part to play later on in, in registrations and, and decisions made regarding them? But, you know, for everything, you know, that, that Fergus won, he didn't change the culture within that organisation. No, and it's probably it not. was probably, you know, with Hugh Dallas, you know, anti-Catholic emails having to resign. Referees deciding it's okay to lie to a Celtic manager. Or even look at Dundee United. You know, we all saw Craig Levine's rap. You know, it's the only thing that marked was Rangers winning at Ibrox. Dundee United didn't have a chance. Goals rolled out from offside for 40 years. It's, you know, with, with players behind the ball. Decisions you've never seen before or since in that game. You know, you, you had Hearts who were going to walk, walk off the park as well since then. Mm -hmm. You know, it's unusual. There's, it's almost a part of as if it's part of assistance, perhaps. That it involves a certain amount of frustration from other teams in the league that there's just inexplicable decisions that favour one team. Yeah, you know how bad does it have to get when a chairman's going to walk his team off the park? You know, well, it, it's crazy. And at the weekend again, we're lucky. Celtic are lucky, not because we're not a decent football team. We don't get that penalty, and then yeah, everybody can see a penalty wipes them out from behind. You know, crucial point in the match just before half time. It's hard mm -hmm. to get Livingston down a difficult park. You saw that the, the breakthrough in the time of that could be crucial for Celtic. Exactly, Lawrence, and we'll, we're going to bring it right back up to date, but the, the main point you've made there, which is relevant to talking about Fergus McCann, is that he took on the SFA. He won the battle, right? He won that battle, but the culture remained, and the culture has continued right up until our last domestic fixture against Livingston. So, it, you know, for anyone who doesn't know exactly what happened, obviously there was a few battles between Fergus and the SFA, but there was a deliberate delay in the registration of George Cadet who ended up missing games where he well, could the, have played. The, the, let's be clear, three times it was deliberately delayed. Yeah. It wasn't just once, you know, even after the you know, FIFA had intervened and said no, 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 international clearance is fine you don't need to worry about the contents of the contract, go ahead and register them. Three times <laughs> you know the SFA refused that registration. So if anybody Anybody up until that point in the 1990s, Lawrence, was under any doubt, and I'm not sure they would be. Here is the starting point for this conversation, right? We could go further back. We could go further back, you know, Sir Robert Kelly versus the SFA. We could talk about um, the efforts for Celtic not to fly the Irish flag at Celtic Park, which has happened on three occasions, to my knowledge, and it may have actually happened prior to that. Three times a Celtic chairman or uh, MD had to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the SFA to ensure that we flew the Irish tricolour at Celtic Park. So when we, under Fergus, had to then use Hamden Park, and we're going to get right up to the nitty-gritty of this game at the weekend, but it's, it, what we're doing now is painting the picture, Lawrence. When, Lauren, when Fergus McCann had to go to the SFA, bonnet in hand, to play at Hamden Park, my first season ticket, Kevin Graham's first season ticket, um, at Hamden Park, in the contract, it actually stated that there would be no flying of foreign flags. That was the wording used. So Fergus was told that Celtic couldn't fly the tricolour at Hamden Park in 1994-95. It's not 100 years ago. So yeah. this is what the wee guy was up against, Lawrence, and he fought them. And what was the result? Jim Farry lost his job because he was right. We Fergus was right. I could tell you what the result was. I think uh, Celtic had just under £300,000 compensation. You know, for what well, essentially could have cost him a, a league and cup double, and Jim Farry get just over three hundred thousand pound payoff. Right. <laughs> in financial terms, who's the winner of it? I know. You I know, know. it tells you something about the culture. You know, they went, okay, we're back rights. We can't provide this evidence that we provided to three committees behind closed doors. We can't have it in an open arbitration. So, what were they saying behind closed doors that cleared Jim Farry that they couldn't say an open ar arbitration? You, you, you know, what What did they fear to speak of? They, they wanted to wait. The awards at the end of it for Fari were more than Celtic were compensated. I know. And it was a reward, let's be honest. You've done that. It, it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. Now, 
what the reason we're talking about this, uh, Liam, is we're painting a picture in terms of the culture of the SFA versus Celtic. Now, the tagline is time for Scottish football to wake up to this pattern of assistance. And obviously, mm -hmm. there is links between this conversation, what's happened this weekend with regards to the officials who have been appointed to referee uh, and oversee the Rangers versus Celtic game, and linking this into a conversation I had with Alan Morrison on Friday night. And what happens whenever you want to have a proper balanced discussion about this, guys, is social media definitely is not the platform for that because the nuance of this discussion is lost with all the background noise. And before you know it, it, it you know, you get your old tinfoil hats and you get your paranoia and all this nonsense. In order for us to actually discuss this properly, you need to park that. This is the facts. Fergus McCann took the SFA on, right? Toe to toe with SFA and won. But since then, Liam, since then, we have had the implosion of Rangers Football Club overseen by the same SFA who could have intervened, who could have done a lot more, who in actual fact it was hand in glove when it came to registrations, when it came to side letters, when it came to EBTs. So this is the same SFA and that wasn't a million years ago either. So we're, we're taking this right up to 2012. And, and prior to that, you've got the Doogie Doogie affair. And, and you've got Hugh Dallas, head of referees, with regards to his own prejudice against our people, against Catholics. So, Liam, this is the same SFA that, that we are dealing with, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's the problem. You've got, you can't have an intelligent discussion about this because what they do, the media who are basically they'll just, um, they'll just pick and choose what they want to, to say. And at the end of the day, if you spend enough time on social media, you can pick out any half wit saying what you want them to say. Yeah. And that is what they're doing. Liam is dropping in and out for me, Lawrence. Is he dropping in and out for yeah, right you at the moment? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we'll come back in. But again, as I say, this isn't about looking to the past and saying, oh, look at us, sympathy vote, victim culture, all that kind of stuff, Lawrence. What it is, is painting the picture. This is what we're up against, right? And when I say our people, what I don't mean to say is that every single Celtic fan is a Catholic, but a great deal of Celtic supporters, Lawrence, come from an Irish Catholic background. And when someone like Hugh Dallas has got a prejudice against that group of people. That's a concern. Listen, both myself and you, we, you, you know, we carry our own biases and you know we're going to see Celtic, from a Celtic point of view or a Celtic state of mind. If you want to look and see what would be the optimal for the SFA, they've got a duty of care to their referees. Mm -hmm. Ron is standing accused of re-refereeing a game. Yeah. So much, you know, obviously Brendan is charged and found guilty. Yeah, of calling him incompetent. And it, listen, it can't be incompetent. The guy's passed his refereeing ex exams. So there's no doubt he knows the rules of football. It's a re refusal to apply them here we're talking about, or apply them impartially. But what kind of pressure are they putting John Beaton under? What kind of pressure are they putting Alan Muir under? <laughs> what duty do they have to them? Was there no other official they could have picked? Because these guys were hand-picked for these positions. That you, you know, they didn't draw them out of hat. They've decided the best things for Scottish football to put John Beaton in the firing line in this game, a man who is known in some parts as cheating beaten, you know, such as a perception of some of his decisions. Do you think that's really fair to John Beaton? Listen, I don't know if he's biased or not. He certainly has some strange decisions that seem to favour Rangers. Do you think it's fair to put him in that place? Al Muir, the amount of decisions he's had against Celtic and his, his recent record, is it fair to put him under that pressure? Was there no one you know, that would step forward and say, listen, this is probably not fair to the way we look after referees. Never mind what it's doing for the whole of football. If you if you want to look at Scottish football, you know, if you're to ask Hibs and Hearts fans, they probably couldn't really care too much about the referees in the Celtic Rangers game. But would you think it'd be fair? Would you think John Beaton would be biased towards Rangers? I guess they'd probably say, oh, I think it would be. You know, he's got it in just, you know, he's about, bias is so apparent. He's got a Rangers supporters club named after him. Mm -hmm. you, you know, it's, I've never heard the F3 having a supports club named after him. So, the, the SFA here, the, the death went out of their way to pick these two guys. You know, and who, who is it that's choosing? Is it the guy that's leaving at the end of the season? I don't know why he's leaving, you know, it's, I think it was seeking new opportunities. I don't know how many head of F3 in positions there are in Scotland. So, you know, as they continue it, in UEFA, is that what he's looking for? He's going to get position there? Maybe. 
But the fact that he's leaving, you know, he, really his decisions are without consequence for him personally. If he's leaving, as has been suggested, that there's a part in assistance since mm -hmm. he became head of refereeing. Well, is there anything to stop him continuing that up until he leaves his post? Because there's no sanction against him. What are you going to do is sack him? Well, he's leaving anyway. Exactly. You, you know, so that, then you look at these two two appointments and you go, well, I think if Rangers had picked the two guys, these are the two guys they would have picked. I'm not suggesting Rangers actually Rangers pick referees, you know, it'd be that'd be beyond the pale winter, even for Scottish football. But you know, they've not done the game any favours at all. They'll probably put intolerable pressure on John Beaton and Alan Muir, who's, you know, I think reputations about amongst fans of teams other than Rangers are, are probably somewhat circumspect. So it, it, it's just crazy, you know, what they try to do to the game up here. Are they actually trying to say, look, it doesn't matter if there's a part of assistance. We don't care. We You're don't care. Yeah. You know, if there's unconscious bias, whatever it's, we don't care. You know, we will run the game the way we see fit behind closed doors. And don't it doesn't matter if best for the game. And don't question us once. You know, <laughs> Exactly, because the, I think I'm, I'm going to bring in uh, Liam again. It's unfortunate we've had a few wee issues with regards to the signal, but I really do respect his view on matters such as this. So I'll be bringing Liam in just in a moment. But yeah, the reason we're, we're going back to, to uh, past instances of um, issues with the SFA is to paint a picture of the culture that has previously existed. It's not about paranoia. Um, and if you call it out, people try to question your credibility. Lawrence and people um, online say, oh, you know, I thought you were more balanced than that, Paul John. What, what is more balanced? Actually trying to, you know, continue with a narrative you don't believe in because the data and the experience of dealings with SFA tells you something completely different. I don't believe that narrative. I believe that we now have an SFA who have a contempt for Celtic. There is an arrogance about them in order to um, think it's a good idea to put Don Robertson in charge of the Livy game. There's an arrogance about them to think it's a good idea to put John Beaton as the referee at Ibrox. And, and we're going to go through this entire, uh, th this entire situation because it isn't us setting ourselves up here because th this is the type of thing that needs to fuel your fire as a fan base. It needs to fuel your fire as a manager and as a team because, you know, collectively there's very little at the moment collectively that we can do about it. And then you're looking at the, the, the real high profile, high power figures at our football club to, to actually take them to task. And I thought last week was around doing something along those lines. And I'm going to bring Liam back in. Liam, hopefully I can hear you because I love your, your state of mind. I love your point of view. Um, on the points that we've discussed so far, where we're basically looking at the backdrop of Celtic and the way that we've been treated by the governing body within this, this country. I mean, it's not paranoia. I mean, it's all it's all laid out there as facts, isn't it? Yeah, and that that's that's the point I was trying to make before my internet decided to die on me. Um, the uh, the thing is, we can't discuss this intelligently because the the media and those you know the Rangers crowd in the in the SFA whatever will just cherry pick the the loony comments and put those up rather than the documented evidence that we all have. Um, that there is clearly uh, a pattern of bias and corruption. You know, I'm, I'm just going to go straight up and call it corruption. You can't even say there's a hint of it anymore. It's there. It's plain to see. And making beat on the ref on Sunday just kind of puts a tin hat on it. Um, you know, and uh, I'll, I'll just say this now. Once we scalp them at the weekend, it's going to make it all the sweeter because they really are deploying every single dirty wee trick in the book to try and stop us. And, oh, it's going to be so sweet. You're right, and, and I'm going to bring this up, uh, Lawrence, because I think it, it's a wee bit uh, fortuitous that you're on today, Lawrence, because I know that if you were ever to go into Mastermind, Celtic versus the SFA would be your specialist subject, and people look forward to you being on the show because I think it's basically you're the guy with a flamethrower, not Dermot Desmond, as we had hoped uh, on our thumbnail last week. But what Liam says is, is spot on, um, and what we're talking about here is, is kind of margins, and what are... What I really took from the discussion on Friday with Alan is the type of influence a referee can actually have in a game. Now, this flies against this quote that constantly comes up, and it might come up today in the comment section, that, that is attributed to Jock Steen in relation to if you're good enough, the referee doesn't matter. 
Now, I have had the privilege over the years of speaking to dozens of people who played under the great man. Him on your T-shirt, the great Tommy yes. Gemmell. I spoke to Tommy Gemmell. I sp I've spoken to these guys, and I'm so privileged to have done so. Behind closed doors, Jockstein did not have that attitude when it came to the officials' lots. You know, that's, that's an HB soundbite to almost say, look, stop moaning. You're good enough. You'll win the game. But these margins can be absolutely pivotal to the outcome of the game. He also had public comments criticising referees when yeah. decisions made. You, you, you know, so, yeah, you, you know, it's maybe cherry-picking comments. Listen, people are, they're able to do that. And, you, you know, I'll cherry-pick. Instance, like Stonewall, you know, at the weekend. Quickest sort of VAR review ever, possibly. <laughs> you know, uh, what I've seen there, you know, that there's no justification for it. You know, at some point, we've got to say, listen, there needs to be better for Scottish football. Because it's not just sell to get fixed. You saw Albion Rovers being cheated out at a famous victory at Ibrox. We've seen Hearts almost, you know, the chairman going to walk his players off the park. Craig Levine, his comments at Ibrox. Yeah. The SFA, or the clubs at least, need to get together and go, listen, what does this could look like for us? Because this doesn't work. You know, there's a pattern of assistance. Or there's a pattern that's unusual. You know, whether it's unconscious bias or deliberate, it's, it's hard to prove. But it's something they should be tackling and saying, well, look, what do we do to reduce this or at least take away the perception of bias? How do we improve the game? And it, I, and it, the looks of it, they have no interest in it, improving the game. Absolutely zero interest. Listen, you know, John Beaton, he's a pint of a Rangers boozer, but if he's a Rangers fan, why shouldn't he? What is unfair is to put him in charge of a Celtic Rangers game and put that kind of pressure on him. Especially with his track record of uh, succumbing to what looks like it's comes to pressure or unconscious bias. But the SFA put him in the final line again. Do they think that's best for John Beaton? Do they think it's best for Scottish football? And on the back of, obviously, Brendan Rodgers' charge, you're thinking, you maybe want to look, look what you're doing here. We know the SFA can make those decisions because they've done it with Willie Collin when Rangers complained about it. Okay. Another Rangers game for a while. So, so we know sometimes the lack of a duty care. Why not on this occasion? Well, well isn't it so important that they, they have this man in the middle as opposed to one of their other qual qualified referees who, who perhaps, whose decisions aren't under so much scrutiny? Well, we spoke about that last week going into the Livy game, Lawrence, and it's right to bring it up about duty of care of their employees, part-time as they may be, with regards to putting him in the firing line in a game which is still, you know, one of the biggest derbies on the planet. Um, and the reason that we're getting a bit of background here is to show that there has been an ongoing culture of culture of, of assistance towards one side or against Celtic even. And now there's a pattern of assistance towards one particular team. I mentioned the flag gate. Go and have a wee look at the Celtic wiki if you're not familiar with it. I know many of those uh, tuning in will be familiar with it. Flying the Irish tricolour really annoys many, many people in, in Scotland and in Scottish football. And in the 1960s, as maligned as he was uh, uh, many, many times by many fans, uh, Robert Kelly, later Sir Robert Kelly, refused um, to take the flag down. You know who who gifted them the flag that uh, that was in question as well, Lawrence at that particular. Time, that was the that was the the man himself, yes, and that was flying at Celtic Park. Um, Desmond White later on uh, was also asked to to bring it down. Um, the nineteen sixty scenario actually went to a vote um, in relation to whether or not Celtic should be able to fly the flag, and um, the deciding vote, bizarrely enough. Um, fell on Rangers who said, yeah, they should be able to fly it. You move into the 1970s and the quote that I continually go back to with regards to Jock Steen, where he said that when Celtic are concerned, natural justice doesn't seem to apply when he was talking about Scottish football and the decisions that was made. You move into the 1980s, anyone who was at the League Cup final then called the Skull Cup final, where Rangers beat us 2-1. And you'll remember it, Lawrence. You, you'll remember it vaguely as well, Liam. You're about the same age as me. That was the game when Brian McClear scored an absolutely phenomenal goal that is often forgotten because it was it came in a defeat. Maurice Johnston left the park and blessed himself. Tony Shepard was incorrectly sent off. You'll remember it, right? And Davy Hay gathered these players on the park 
and told him to leave the field of play. He then gave an interview the following week saying, you know, this is ridiculous, we should go and play in England. You move into the 1990s, Fergus McCann comes to the club, goes toe-to-toe with the SFA um, for a number of different reasons. But the George Cadet registration uh, was the one that really came to a head and, and it resulted in the loss of Jim Farry's position at the SFA. You move into the 2000s and the 2010s. When you, when you look at the way that uh, Rangers were protected, but, but I think you're missing out, you're also Chris Robertson at Ibrox, getting the Hearts players, and he was going to withdraw the team. Such were the yeah. decisions. The decisions. You're missing out Craig Levine at Dundee United at Ibrox. Was Such that the, the game? Was that the game, Lawrence, where Pasquale, Bruno and all these guys all got sent off? I think there yeah. was like three or four sending offs. Yeah, yeah. if it had been one more sending off the game, it had to be It would have been abandoned, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the rules. And then Craig Levine at Ibrox is <laughs> incandescent with rage and quite rightly so. You know the guy scores from, what, 35 yards? There's yeah. a number of players in front of him when he hits the ball. And it's real ball. It's it, just crazy decisions. But, again, it's not just that Celtic thing, you know. Again, favouring one team. One team. A- against all others. You oh, sorry, look at when, uh, Yeah, yeah. When we, when we stop the 10, and you look at the fact that, all right, there's a referee, he's retiring. He wants his last game to be... Um, a game involving Lee. Oh, yes, we'll give them the Rangers game against Kilmarnock. Ali Mitchell, it was, I think, that spoiled that party. And then yep. you move into the, the 2000s and into the 2010s. And with regards to the authority who should be overseeing the correct registration of players, the payments of players and otherwise, the conflict of interest between Rangers Football Club and Dunfermline Athletic when the chairman of Rangers appoints the manager of Dunfermline. And then you go into the, the tax payables when it comes to the European registration to actually play European football. Oh, we'll just ignore them guys, right? Because if we don't, then Rangers won't get a European licence to play in European football. And that might just save them. That might just give them enough money to, to actually, you know, um, batter away some of these bills uh, that are piling up um, at Ibrox. So time and time again, decade upon decade, Anybody who's an older head can maybe give me some examples from the 50s and before. But there's examples from the 60s right up till now. And then we come to the situation at Tynecastle that uh, resulted, Liam, in Brendan Rodgers' his only ban in professional football. And we were building ourselves up to a degree that Celtic would have the backbone, that we wouldn't be the toothless tigers going into that disciplinary hearing, and that we would really take them to task. After the decision was made and he got a one-match ban with one match suspended, some seen it as a victory, Liam. But what I think the SFB had done since then has shown a contempt, this continuous contempt that we've been shown since at least the 60s, probably before, probably since our formation, to be honest with you, um, uh, by the nomination that Robertson would be the best referee against Livingston and, of course, Beaton would be the best referee against Rangers. What does the club do about this? Are they doing enough in your view? No. Um, you know, I, th- I said it last week and I'll, I'll be consistent with it. If this had happened to Rangers, they would have had about 20 statements out by now they would have threatened to pull their sponsorship for the league, all, all kinds of things. They would have, like, you know, threatened absolute bedlam and they would have got their own way because when they throw a tantrum, they get what they want. Mm-hmm. And I don't want Celtic to become a club that throws tantrums, but if that's what's necessary to get some fair play, then we might just have to start doing that. You know, we should not accept referees that are at best incompetent. Um you know, let's just let's just just for a minute, let's just say that I entertain the notion that there isn't a bias there. They're just bad referees because these are demonstrably wrong decisions that are being given. They should not be refereeing what is the flagship game of Scottish football at the weekend. You know, they really shouldn't be doing that, but they're going to because the SFA have basically said to Celtic, "Well, <laughs> we don't Obvious. care what you think because aye, cause you're not going to complain about it because you just sit there and take it." Yeah, you take and that's it. What we've done. We've taken it for too long. Now, you're right, Liam, because there is a complete change as to how we deal with any scenario. Rangers, statement after statement after statement to the point it becomes wallpaper and everybody stops looking at it and listening to them, right? Celtic, on the other hand, are the other end of the scale. We remain silent constantly on matters involving our football club, the supporter base, those who have paid in. And this is the thing when the demise of Rangers and people don't want to talk about stripping the titles and all that. What about every single Scottish football fan that paid into the rigged game? The rigged game when Rangers were incorrectly registering players and there were side letters to ensure that they got paid more money because if they didn't pay the player that money, they wouldn't be at the football club. 
Stefan Kloss was making more money than David Beckham when he played for, for Rangers. It, it was ludicrous. But the SFP overseen that, thought that was all right, and let them away with it. The same club myth. You know, let's just run with that. Let's just run with that because the club never ever come out and say anything in relation to it. And the fan base are up against a brick wall of silence from the media and absolute noise and, and toxicity from the opposing fan base. Let's let's have a wee look at the fact that Dundee's game against Rangers was uh, called off for the waterlogged pitch, Lawrence. First available day, I would suggest would be tomorrow, tomorrow night. night. Yeah. yeah. Why is it next? Why is it next week? Well, because tomorrow night's not available. Couldn't be the only reason, surely. Although it's available, you know they, they, they should say why. But but listen, you, you touched on it. You know, Rangers put out statements and Celtic's acquire, but. The, definitely the current system Rangers are putting out statements we can only assume that they'd be happy to get it changed because it's not working for them and it, it, Celtic really need to drive change you, you know and I think the referee is amateur at best yeah you know when we brought in VAR oh Jesus I think we're the only team who's had a camera not working for one goal audio goal missing you know it it's not believable, you know. It's, it's almost if a seven-year-old's come up with these excuses. What will they tell them now? The camera's not working. No, it's not, it's not working. We had pointed it the wrong way. We didn't know which way the camera worked. <laughs> you, you know, it's like, come on, behave yourself. Was that another excuse during the, the 7-1 game in 1957 oh, yeah. as well? <laughs> we, we, we left the, the camera cover on. But, like, Celtic should be going to Hibs. Fucking happy every weekend. We should be going to the other clubs that, that are suffering from this and saying, look, we need to come up with something credible. Imagine when, when VAR was getting launched. I mean, this isn't unforeseeable what happened here. After all, it's going to be the same refs in charge of the, the technology. If Celtic could put something forward saying, look, there's a perception of bias in Scottish football that doesn't do it any favours. You know, it makes the game less sellable. It makes it a bit of a joke. Why don't we contact other associations, partner with them, get a centre of excellence for VAR, reduce the cost that VAR's going to cost us, and get an improved product for the paying customer. And put that out publicly as a, a proposition to the SFA. You know, I think there's too much going on behind closed doors. Why is the head of referee moving on? Are we not allowed to know? You know, because there something went wrong there. Can is I ask you a question, Lord? Can I ask you a question? Part? Go for it. I think it's wishful thinking, actually to think that something's going on. Um, off the top of your head, instantly, have I asked you this question? When do you remember Crawford Allen coming out and speaking out about a decision in Scottish football? Which decision was it involving who? I think it's only ever spoke about uh, Kyogo Parkhead against Hearts. And yes. For me, Kyogo's still on, on side. But if you remember, he phoned Radio Clyde from his holiday. He broke off his holiday to phone a radio station. Such was his anger at that decision or but you, you still look at it. For me, Hugo's still on side. <laughs> you know, he, he's not talked about any number of ridiculous decisions. Like uh, since then, in a similar manager, he's not been so enraged by them that he's having to phone a radio station. It's it's crazy. You, you know, it's absolutely crazy. But you know, he, he's moving on, is it because of patterns of assistance? Who knows? But but certainly, you know, right up to the weekend. If anyone wanted to, you know, have anecdotal evidence for Alan Morrison's patterns of, of assistance, so you just had to look at the two games at the weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, Lawrence. Some brilliant comments coming in. I'm really keen to bring you all in because we're already 35 minutes into the show. Uh, such is the emotional impact of such a game at the best of times, never mind this this level of contempt being shown to the football club. Um, the reason I brought up Crawford Darwin because I, I, I genuinely can't remember Liam, another occasion where he's come out and spoke about a specific incident in a game involving any team from Scotland, other than that Kyogo marginal decision was it offside, was it onside? It's not as if somebody went, you know, studs up and caught somebody in the midriff. Kyogo just beat the offside trap and he comes out, as Lauren says, phones in from holiday to speak about it. It's ludicrous. I mean, the thing is, what... um what kind of society allows someone like that to get in a position of power in the first place? And I'm going to go full conspiracy theorist here, so feel free to shoot me down in the comments. But, you know, we live in a country now where, well, you guys live in a country, I don't. You live in a country now 
where it is, you know, orange walks are perfectly fine, but calling somebody a hun is potentially a hate crime. I mean, you know, this is the kind of thing we're up against. You can't have a reasoned debate where you have that level of bigotry and bias in daily society. Um, and it infects the football. And, you know, that's why you're going to have a mass hate crime at the weekend. Thousand mutants all singing about Fenians and whatever. Um, and uh, nothing will be done about it because they're allowed to do it. But if I call one of them the H word, I'm committing a hate crime. Well, I'll be listening with interest uh, to the songbook this weekend, seeing how Celtic's uh, songbook was called out prominently uh, last week. So that that is something I'll be listening out for. Now, that, that's another thing I would actually point out, is the fact that Rangers get free reign, like a spoilt kid throwing all the toys at the pram. In 2018, when they get so sick of Celtic tying flags against the goalposts that they even put the staunch steward on the goalpost. That's his That's his uh, match detail, Lawrence. You're on the goalpost. Don't, don't let Lee Griffiths tie another scarf to it. There was that element of them hating uh, the celebrations in the Broomlawn stand. There was another the element where they needed the money and they had to sell those seats to season ticket holders. Nothing happened. Nothing happened until now. They were given free reign to do what they wanted in relation to ticket allocation. Nobody intervened. The SFA are weak. They're weak when it comes to Rangers. They are certainly uh, show nothing but contempt when it comes to Celtic. And I'm going to bring in some of the, the comments coming through. David Boyle. Celtic should release a statement as it's a complete swipe at Celtic after the hearing. Further, uh, the Willie Collum request by Rangers being granted and needs highlighted. Yeah, one rule for one and one for someone else, it, it seems, David. Ian Roy, welcome back to the show. You're on the YouTube. Beaton will have his pre-match breakfast in the Loudoun. The team then taking a taxi to his people on the other side. There is a lot of mentions of the word brazen um, in relation to this. Can you imagine a, a referee after the game or on the weekend or after a game against Rangers going to the brazen heat, Lawrence, and enjoying a wee pint or two with a Celtic fan. Seriously, if that it happened, he would never referee another Glasgow derby again if he was allowed to referee in the top league again. Listen, you know, for me, John Beaton's a little pickies pub. He's a Rangers fan, we all know it. You know, I don't think he pretends to be anything other than a Rangers fan. You know, a Rangers fan with a whistle, albeit. But you've got to look at Scottish football and say, what is it? Makes you think that you're paying somebody. You know, he's probably on a lot more money for that game than some players that are in the Premier League. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you're going to make it a fan of one of the teams involved. It's, it's crazy. You know, yes, on, yes, on more on. money, Lawrence. Yes, on more. Sorry to interrupt, mate, because some of the Livy guys are on 500 quid a week. So he's is is on double. Yeah. Double with, with professional football lands. Listen. It, it, and where are they getting this money from? The money's generated by the fans. It, you know, in Celtic, and I think other clubs need to be pushing for change. You know, that this is a system that might have been okay, you know, in the 1900s, but is it okay now? The, I'd say not. You, you know, you want to put the, the game as best as can be. We might never win the World Cup, Scotland, or, you know, do well in the Euros, but there's, there's things you could lead the way in, isn't there? You know, you, we're well, certainly way behind the times, you know, we're the only country, as far as I know, that doesn't ask refs to declare their allegiances. Maybe it's because their allegiances are so well known. It'd be ridiculous to ask Johnny New Rangers fan, <laughs> because they know. But, you know, Celtic need to be not picking on single games, but I think it's a wholesale change of the, the rules in the setup. Because it's ridiculous, you know, this is a setup that's delivered ahead of the SFA president. You know, with a long career in there, but had to resign. Head of refereeing. At one point, you know, his favourite team were, were referred to as the Dallas Cowboys, such was his favourite to them. I mean, Ste Stephen Mahi getting sent off for being filled in the box. Ridiculous. You know, he has to resign because of anti Catholic emails. This was the, the challenge. He was moving under a cloud. What this was a Kanchelskis challenge, wasn't it? Yeah, Kinchelskis. Yeah. Watch it back. Look, look at the, the actual expression on Andre Kinchelskis' face. Oh, he knows. When, when he sees it unfolding. Yeah, he knows. But, it, it, listen, unless Celtic drive change and speak to the other clubs and say, look, this is absolutely ridiculous. And it should be going to you ever. You know, listen, because it's a crazy situation to put yourself in season after season. As much as people say, you know, 
prepared this one. Yeah, Jim Farry had to resign. He, he, he get more money than Celtic got for over that. Nothing really changed though. <laughs> you, you, the culture remains. Yeah, yeah. As, as so unless they change the culture, you're going to get the same results. You're going to get so the same results. You had obviously Chris Robertson going to walk a team off. Craig Levine going crazy in an interview. You just can't allow it to keep happening. And you know where well, Paul McMaid could rest them. You know he, he seemed to to step up and take them to task. Yeah, you John Reed at some point. You know, like him a, a lot of these politics. I know some of the fan base may, may, may not agree with his politics, but the club seems to have now meekly accepted this now. We don't have that figurehead. Like you mentioned there, Fergus was the guy. He wouldn't mind going toe-to-toe -to -toe with this cabal. Um, the pattern of assistance is something that we are going to continually talk about. I don't care what kind of response you get from the other side on social media. It doesn't matter to me if people think that, that this actually is detrimental to the credibility of a Celtic state of mind because I feel so strongly about it that I would disagree. I think if you, if you don't shine a light on this, Liam, then you're doing a disservice to the Celtic fans. Aye, but you know what I will say, though? The more this comes up and the more we talk about it, the more confident I am we are just going to go out and scalp those lavy drinkers at the weekend, honestly. <laughs> I really just think... I've never felt so good about a game against them for a long time. I just feel like this is all building up. Do you like being they underdog, are... Liam? Do you like being underdog, do you think? Well, the thing is, though, six months ago, we weren't the underdog. We've allowed ourselves to be portrayed as the underdog. But they haven't beat us in a meaningful game in a long time. Um, and, you know, they can say, oh, we beat you last season. Aye, after the league was won. Mm -hmm. um, same again the year before. They haven't beaten us. The last time Rangers beat us, in a, or any incarnation of Rangers, I should say, beat us in a game that mattered was September 2021. That's the last time they beat a game, beat us in a game that was consequential. So, no, I am confident that we're going to go out and beat them. And I think all of this is just building up to... Uh... Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, can I just pick up on something? I'm just seeing the comments there. Uh, how is Lavi Drinker a hate crime? <laughs> I'm sorry, but that is just utter pish. I've got to call that out. Sorry, like, is what is... <laughs> what have I been big, is biggest of kids' toilets? Is that what it is? is it Wait, just to be clear, you're in Japan and live under Japanese law, yeah? Yes, you do. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, you can drink from any toilet you want. The, the <laughs> locus of this crime is not in Scotland. There you go. Well done. Okay. Well pointed out, Lawrence. I like your knowledge. Um, no, thanks for bringing in all the comments. Um, th this is something that, I, as I said before, I don't really care for the um, opinion of Rangers supporters when it comes to this because they are so blinkered in their view. I'm not looking to curry favour from uh, that fan base. What I'm looking for is the best for Celtic Football Club at all times. And sometimes, like Fergus saw when he came in, uh, sometimes it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable sometimes to call out the big, big issues in Scottish football um, because he took it tight. As I say, the Celtic Exchange, go and watch those interviews. We, we did a series of interviews on Axon for the 25th anniversary, uh, audio interviews that are all on the YouTube channel. But recently, Tino at the Celtic Exchange has gone and interviewed a lot of these guys who were involved. And it really brings home where we were as a football club and how difficult it would have been for someone from the outside, let's remember. And I know that, he's, that his history was in Croy and he was involved with the Croy CSC and he used to run the Croy CSC more or less at the age of about 15 or 16 before going over to Canada and making his millions. But we Fergus was right up against it. And at every single turn, not only the authorities, a lot of Celtic fans didn't believe that he was going to do what he set out to do. But he did. Very strong, world we get character. I'd love to see an up-to-date interview with him. And actually, tune into the Wandering Paradise on Monday night because Tino's uh, going to be taking that wander with me. The absolute arrogance of the SFA, James Devine, I agree. The words that I would keep going back to is arrogance and contempt towards Celtic Football Club. David Cooper, now we should leave Scotland and let them earn their own money. We don't need this. It's a sport. They need an advantage and beatings the man. See this, this argument I constantly see, Lawrence, about, wait a minute, the game's rigged. Look at all the trophies you've won. I mean, I, I hear it all the time. And, and for me, I think what you're doing there is you're just ignoring the fact that there's a lot of data Go and watch the show on Friday night. There's a lot of data which drives decisions 
Rangers away. No matter who they're playing, by the way, it doesn't matter if they're playing Celtic. So you win, you win these these trophies, and you have these successes in spite of all that. You can't just say, "Listen, we keep winning. We might lose a league here or there," because these are inherent issues within the game, under the surface of the game, and now at the forefront of the game that affects every Scottish club bar Rangers. Listen, well, for me, you know, it's mostly anecdotal evidence. I've not done the deep dive that Alan Morrison has done and looked into the stats. I've watched this programme and you're thinking they definitely show a part and would maybe confirm my conscious bias towards Celtic that, yeah, Rangers do seem to be getting a lot of decisions and key decisions their way all over the park and throughout the game. I mean, there's things like they've now got the high record scoring defender in British football. They've had 17 penalties, record on penalties this season. It just, it all seems strange if there's nothing tying it together. But even Rangers fans have compl complained about the refs, and, and Rangers have complained and, and got, you know, Willie Colin banned from, from ref in their matches, but it looks at Why wouldn't they want to drive change? Why wouldn't they want something better? You know, Celtic should be going to the other clubs and saying, look, and we should be coming up with a proposal and going, look, we know Scottish referees fly over to other countries to referee their derbies. Why, why don't we do that? Why don't we share refs with them? Why don't we kind of improve the quality of refs overall? Why don't we reduce the costs in VAR, share it between four associations? You know, take away that perception of bias. Don't put guys like John Beaton in the fight. I mean, what kind of... They're feeding it. Yeah. John, listen, he's a Rangers fan. He's allowed to drink in Rangers pubs and he's going to be biased towards Rangers. It's only human. Why is he being put under that kind of pressure for the SFA being, being given this game? It, it, mate, it's ridiculous. And you know, most of the country, you, you know, will be talking about it and saying, I thought you'll be quite happy about that appointment. If you're a Celtic fan, you're not going to be happy. And, you, you know, fans that people that aren't fans of the Glasgow too will probably be thinking, having a laugh, look, look what SFA is doing again. You know, this is just crazy. But it's in no way a professional run organisation. You know, that they make decisions for the greater good of the game in the country. You, in the participation of football, and the, the per head of capita audience for foot, football in Scotland is higher than it, any other country in the world. Yep. And that's in spite of the SFA and the way they run the game. Imagine if they actually ran the game correctly. What kind of TV deal could we get? Could we then like, start competing with bigger countries for players? Could we put a better product on the park? Rather than scraping qualifications for, you know, the, the, the Euros, could they give a better account of themselves? Could they go further? You know, I, I can remember 78 and Alan McLeod had his all believing, you know, Scotland were going to come back with a medal of some sort. God, in those days, you know, the players were, were putting on the park. What kind of... It, it, it's just crazy way, way to run it. And the SFA just, you know, they're showing their consent, not just for Celtic, but for the wider Scottish football. Yeah. And it's it, it's absolutely ridiculous. You know, I, I don't know what kind of training they'll be giving John Beaton to, to handle this kind of pressure. But you guys are under total pressure getting into this game now. Yeah, he absolutely is. Um, he's playing, he's he's running and refereeing a game uh, watched exclusively by Rangers supporters at Ibrox. So I think the within that colder and that 90 minutes, it'll be absolutely fine. But the pressure leading into the game, um, there's, there's obviously quite a lot of uh, comments coming through, which I'm really keen to bring up. I'm also keen to... Um, absolutely underline and highlight Liam's comment around how great it will be if we absolutely <laughs> destroy them at the weekend after all of this discussion. But the discussion has to be had. Welsh Paul, they are desperate to get hold of that 60 million and will do anything to get it. Right, okay, great point. And that's when things are ramped up, when there is that bounty at the end of it, um, or there is this, uh, for me, uh, an influence to ensure that a club continues and that's what happened back in the day where things were ignored and um you know registrations were were given by the uh, association of that country um, and were believed by uefa to be genuine uh when they knew that there was uh payables at that time which you know is just a matter of public record it's a fact will mcmillan celtic won't do anything the people in charge are too weak um, that is a concern for me, Will. This is why we started off the discussion with Fergus McCann, because he wasn't too weak. He was the type of guy who would take um, the SFP and anyone else to task. Uh, we've got there's, there's some rule changes, Paul, since Fergus. You know, you could call a referee incompetent back then. 
Can't do it when, now. When was, that, when was that reworded? To can't remember when, but, 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 but you, you can't say that as a, no. a club or an official, you know. Uh, so you can't take the association to court, although one club was allowed to do it without suffering any repercussions for breaking that particular rule. You know, so back then you could have taken your association to court. Back then you could have called them incompetent without breaking the rules. You know, and it's crazy, you know, not only did they mark their own homework, they're not allowed to suggest they're not very good at it. No. You, know, you saying that we are not good at this is breaking the rules. That's why you knew Brendan was going to get some kind of ban. You know, it doesn't matter if it's true or not. You can't say it. Let's not have a discussion. Hibs tweeted out, obviously, um, regards to the, the penalty at the weekend. And they're in hot water because within that legislation that you're referring to, Lawrence, it actually uh, says social media on a social media platform. Mantis, Toboggan, MD, it's not Rangers fans that we need to convince our partners of assistance. It's our own board we need to convince. If you go to the, the video on Friday with myself and Alan Morrison, um, underneath that particular video, there is a link to the Sentinel Selks blog um, and they will advise you, if you are a shareholder of the football club, what you can do, actually, to push for um, a resolution at an AGM, the next AGM. So have a look at that, because that's something we'll be covering in more detail. I want to talk for the last nine minutes or so, Liam, about the game. We've spoken mm. about the everything else that's surrounding it. Um, going into that match, we don't know about the fitness or otherwise of the captain, Callum McGregor. People are asking in the comment section have you seen any of the uh, training photographs from Lennox Town? Not yet. Let us know. Have you seen Callum McGregor in action? Um, does he look as though uh, you know he might make a Lazarus style comeback at the weekend? If he's fit, give me your start, eleven, Liam, and why? Um, how are you going to start? What's the midfield? I, I know that uh, there's a few wingers on form. Uh, obviously, Scales he was, was back with Carter Vickers at the weekend. How do you start? On Sunday, Ibrox. Right. Well, I think the uh, the back box itself. That's you know, it's it's Joe Hart in goals. It's the same back four we've had for the last wee while. Um, midfield is where things get a bit controversial. Um, I would say that Tomoki Iwata has done enough to keep his place, so you don't drop him. Which means you play Kalmak in a more advanced role, and I think Rayo Hatate plays, so that necessitates sticking Matt, Matt O'Reilly on the bench. Um, you know, I just think that if you look at our midfield as it is right now, Matt O'Reilly is the one that, that could afford to drop out. I just think on pure current form, we know how good a player he is, but on pure current form, I would rather have Hatate, Iwata and McGregor in that midfield. Um, then, But saying that, if Kalmak isn't fit, I would have every confidence in going with Iwata, Hatate and uh, O'Reilly. So I'm, I'm okay with that. And then up front, I would go, uh, I'd start with Kyogo and I would have Maeda on the left and Kun on the right. And during the game, at some point, you would bring on Ida for a bit more physical presence up front and I would bring on Yang to run at their defenders when they're tired. Um, let, let Dyson terrorise them for an hour and then stick on Yang to continue the same show. Yeah, uh, listen, plenty to discuss there. I'll give you my team once uh, Lawrence has given me his. Uh, Iwata, massive fan, Lawrence. But if uh, yeah. McGregor, if, if McGregor's fit, um, would you drop O'Reilly to the bench? Do you think he's influential enough to, to stay in the start 11? Well, I, I wouldn't be dropping Iwata. So I'd, I'd agree that Callum would play further forward. And I guess the, it's going to be down to some data that, that Celtic have from training. You know, because both Kalmak and Rio are coming back from injury. You know, how fit are they? No, Rio was tiring at the weekend after 60 minutes. Is he going to be ready for 90? Is he going to be ready for a higher pressure game? Do you want two people in midfield with, with the games lost and one that are both coming back from injury? So, depending on, on, on that, I think both of them have got 90 minutes in them. But start with both. If, if one of them's got 90 minutes, I would go with the same team. But if both are a wee bit off it, I think O'Reilly would stay and McGregor would come in with Rio to come off the bench. So it's going to depend how fit they are. Front three, absolute same as, as Liam. It's the changes. Yeah, I'd expect Yang at some point, probably Ida and James E. Forrest coming on. And the change in midfield, whoever's dropped out, either Rio or, or, or Matt, to come on. 
Interesting. Loads of interesting comments coming through as well, which I'll bring up between now and the end of the show in five minutes' time. Uh, Mikey Boy, controversial comment incoming. You agree with Liam. Um, you drop Matt O'Reilly on Sunday if McGregor is available. Have a latter. McGregor and Rio Atati. However, if it's Matt O'Reilly, Rio and McGregor, then I'm happy too. Hopefully Matt O'Reilly will show his early form. Right, I, I'm looking at the, the view that... Um, I'm coming from the view, rather, that Rio Atati started against Libby. And the reason he started was because he's starting on Sunday. I know they're completely different opponents. I get it. And I think that's why a lot of people would start a water. Because, uh, you know, having that midfielder who can really break up any kind of threat is key. It's pivotal. But I just couldn't do it as much as I love him. I couldn't do it for the loss of Matt O'Reilly. I think Matt O'Reilly, yeah, up and down a wee bit in, in recent times. But um, he's the type of player that can do something special. I always go back to against Rangers, you know, the, the Jota goal with the iconic celebration and the pass from Matt O'Reilly was sensational. I know it started from Callum McGregor's free kick, comes to O'Reilly, the way he cut through that defence, unbelievable. He's still got that in his locker. Um, and I think that my starting 11 would be Joe Hart and Goals, um, who is currently my player of the year, guys. Um, right back, Alistair Johnson. Left back, Greg Taylor. The centre half are Scalzi and Carter Vickers. Midfield three for me is Matt O'Reilly because, yeah, <clears throat> not in form. It's not on form. I'm playing Matt O'Reilly because of what he's capable of in these big games. I'm hoping Callum McGregor's back. If he is, he plays. Um, and Rio Tati. Rio Tati's got to start. So it means McGregor's more of a defensive, in more of a defensive role. And I do think that the front three picks itself at the moment, Maeda, Kyogo and um, Kuhn down the right-hand side. And if you pick that team, I think you've got Yang, Ida and Awata. And I think those three players can come in in the last half hour of the game and really see the game out. I think uh, a lot is brilliant at that, just blocking down attacks, doing all the the kind of um, the unsexy stuff in the midfield. You know, the dirty work. You've got Ida who'll just go up and do the Yakimakis role, throwing them about and stretching the back line. And then Yang, you know, uh, if Kuhn tires, uh, it'll be Yilmaz, I think, at left back. If, if um, I think he's he injured. Him out. Is he injured? That's a shame. Yeah, Yilmaz and Barisic both injured, so I think Kuhn's going to... Run riot. Yeah, well, I don't know who they'll put there. Maybe Sterling, I don't know who, who they're going to put up against. Kuhn, they'll need somebody with a bit of pace, you know, and I think they'll be struggling for options there. So, kind of, their left side defence is probably looking weak, and, you know, we know else left side defence is where most of the, they give away most of the goal opportunities. But, yeah, I think Kuhn will have a, a cracking game. Yeah, it's one of the ones that's kind of all just lined up for him in the last couple of weeks, Lawrence, isn't it? He's a player that's come in. Um, he was written off by a lot of fans, written off early doors in his career. He's then spoken with hindsight about uh, illness and fitness and sharpness and all that kind of stuff, rather than using it as an excuse at the time. Um, and his form's been brilliant. I mean, the goal, sorry, the penalty uh, shout at the weekend, we were uh, because mm. we didn't get it. <clears throat> the secondary assist had Kyogo scored that, um, would have been sensational from Kuhn. The wee dink over to Alistair Johnston was brilliant, absolutely sublime. Not only does he look like Paddy Roberts, he's starting to play like him, and I'm talking about his style. He's got that Aye. kind of style about him, isn't he? Yeah, man of the match for me at the weekend. I thought he was superb. Um, yeah. I, he's really grown into the team as uh, as uh, the games have gone on. It's one of those players, you see it a lot with wingers, but every game you can see marked improvement, and that's that's really good to see. You know, a few weeks ago, we'd have been like, well, Yang's a surefire starter. Then it was like, hmm, Kuhn's shown some good form. Who do we go with? Now I think we're probably 80% leaning on Kuhn starts over Yang. And it's nothing that Yang's done wrong. He just get, he gets sent off at the wrong time, unfortunately, and Kuhn came in a really good vein of form. Yeah, absolutely. And it just shows you the sliding doors moments of football. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, thanks everybody for tuning in. 2,000 strong on this Tuesday afternoon. We had to talk about the uh, officials being announced for the weekend's game in light of everything else that's happened, not just this season, but we have given you examples right back to the 1960s of how Celtic are treated by the uh, authority within Scottish football, the SFA. There is a culture, it's a culture that I think um, as football fans, we rely on our club to be strong when challenging that culture and challenging these decisions. And as many of the comments have come through and said, and as Liam said, how much more sweeter will it be if we go out there on Sunday and absolutely batter them and come home with the three points? That would be phenomenal. 
But it's the culture. It's, if any, listen, yeah. it's not just it holds football in Scotland back. You mean the, the Amy's interview was a Craig Brown talk about what he wanted to do with the money, investing in grassroots football, make sure there are parts for people to play on. The SFA invest. That was in 1998. Yeah. You know. Free football it, it for all kids in Scotland. Yeah. Bottom, you know what I mean? Brian McClure went in. Yeah. The we thing is, look, look at that team he helped bring, bring through at Man United. He if, didn't if last, Lawrence. Use him. He didn't last because he didn't suit the culture within the yeah. SFA. And it's a wee bit like, and I've used the example, different characters entirely, but Don McKay didn't last at Celtic because he liked to challenge, apparently, challenge the norm at Celtic, so he didn't last. And that is a cultural thing. If you don't fit in to the culture, you won't last in an organisation, which is very unfortunate. Um, guys, thank you very much for your time. I've really appreciated it. We're going to be live Thursday, Friday. We are in Gracie's on Thursday night. Lawrence Conley will be there in force, uh, and we'll be in Grangemouth on Friday. There are 15 tickets at the last count available for Gracie's if you want to come along. The evening will be filmed by a German documentary team. Uh, they're going to be picking up on the atmosphere in the build-up to the Glasgow Derby. So be there and enjoy yourself a phenomenal live night with Paddy McCourt, the Derry Pele, the cult icon. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved. 2,000 strong on this Tuesday afternoon. And thank you to Lawrence Connolly and Liam Carrigan for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind.